Um, this lecture, as well as the entire JP2 lecture series, could not have taken place without the support of our university authorities, Father Michał Paluk, the rector of the Angelicum, Father Sestoma Bonino, the dean of the Faculty of Philosophy, and Father Richard Ripka, the director of the St. John Paul II Institute of Culture, whom I would all like to thank. Special thanks are also in order for the founders of the St. John Paul II Institute of Culture, namely the St. Nicholas Foundation, whose president Darius Karovic is with us today, and the Futura Juventa Foundation. We would like also to, uh, to thank and welcome the numerous donors, supporters of the St. John Paul II Institute of Culture and all viewers in front of their screens. We look forward to the day when we all be able to meet again in person. The St. John Paul II Institute of Culture was established to look at the challenges facing the modern world and the church in light of the life and thought of St. John Paul II. The idea of thinking with John Paul II was embodied in the JP2 lecture series, which are monthly lectures of notable interdisciplinary academics who will revisit the extraordinary contributions of St. John Paul II for our own day. Last month at the second GP2 lecture, we had the honor of hosting Professor John Finnis, who spoke on fundamentals of ethics. In our series planned for the entire current 2020-2021 academic year, we will host renowned academic figures such as Professor Marek Chichowski from the College of Europe in Warsaw, Professor John Cavadini from the University of Notre Dame, Father François Daguet from the Academy Catholique de France and Catholic Institute of Toulouse, Professor Chantal Delsol from the Academy Catholique de France and the University of Marne-la-Vallée, Professor Rémy Bragg, Professor Emeritus of the Sorbonne, and Ludwig Maximilian from the University of Munich, and also Professor Renato Christine from the University of Trieste, and Professor Darius Gavin from the Polish Academy of Sciences. Now I am pleased to give the floor to Dr. Darius Karlovic, president of the St. Nicholas Foundation, who will share more about today's guest. We used to say uh, to give a floor, but in fact, in a COVID reality, we should say to give a line or whatever. Uh, dear friends, I'm honored to introduce you um, to the Right Reverend um, Archbishop, Archbishop Rowan Williams, uh, Anglican bishop, scholar, theologian, and poet, Master of Medellin College, Cambridge, and uh, Honorary Professor of Contemporary Christian Thought at University of Cambridge. Uh, Archbishop graduated in theology at uh, Christ College, Cambridge, and obtained the title of Doctor of Philosophy in 75 from Wadham College, Oxford. Uh, he was uh, Archbishop of Wales uh, from 2000 to 2002 and the Archbishop of Canterbury from 2002 to 2012. Appointed as a life peer Baron Williams of Ostermoth in the House of Lords, he held his function from 2013 to his retirement on 31st August 2020. Today's lecture is a faith on modern realms, in which Archbishop Williams refers to the famous uh, speech of St. Paul at the Areopagus in Athens, which, we, which is well known from the 17th chapter of um, Act of Apostles. Uh, during uh, which the um, St. Paul openly expressed what his audience unknowingly worship referring to many topics which are common to the Christian and pagan worlds of his time. Uh, Archbishop Williams will look uh, at some of the places in our contemporary culture where assumptions uh, are made about 
our human environment, which point toward the transcendent context. Among the areas uh, whose vector is clearly aimed at transcendence, uh, it's Bishop Williams will study the idea of irreductible in, uh, in human dignity, the ability to communicate and establish a relation with the other, as well as situation where people are driven to make a stunt in the name of something sacred. Dear Reverend Archbishop, the floor or the line is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. And may I first of all thank uh, Father Yassant and Dr. Kawovic for their very kind words of introduction and welcome. It is for me an enormous privilege to be invited to deliver this lecture. And I am delighted to have the opportunity of honoring the intellectual and spiritual legacy of St. John Paul II. As this lecture unfolds, I hope that it will be clear that many of the inspirations of Pope John Paul's philosophy of the human being are inspirations and sources which I share. What you worship unknowingly, I declare to you plainly, says St. Paul on the Areopagus. He takes it for granted, it seems, that worship is one of the things that human beings do. The task for Paul is not to persuade anyone that worship is necessary, but to bring to light what or who is being worshipped. Now, we ought to be clear at the outset that this is not quite the same as the question, which was popular in liberal theological circles in the middle of the last century, of what is of ultimate concern to people. This is not a discussion about values, that dangerously vacuous term forever hovering on the frontier between descriptive and prescriptive language. It is about what, by definition, commands a measure of attention and loyalty, which pushes the ordinary workings of the self aside and denies that self its normal liberty of definition. Put like that, worship appears reasonably enough as an area of some risk or danger within human affairs. Because to be invited to worship is to be invited to suspend your routine assumptions and to allow yourself to be acted upon, indeed to be defined by, something outside the self. It may, in other words, be the most dramatic example possible of a claim to power, the kind of power that refuses other agencies or presences the capacity to name themselves and to narrate their identity simply in their own terms. In this lecture, I hope to argue that the contemporary force of Paul's Areopagitic argument is precisely in the way it presses us to reflect on worship. More specifically, on how and why a secular worldview is bound ultimately to avoid the difficulty of dealing with the danger of worship. In brief, I want to suggest, first, that a robust concept of the non-negotiable dignity of the human person requires that the only proper object of worship be that which is radically other from the contents of the finite universe. Second, that the phenomenon of human language and the radical trust involved in addressing the human other with the expectation of being understood entail a fundamental orientation away from the apparent naturalness of self-definition in the usual sense. And then third, that once it is clear that God alone is to be worshipped, 
the finite agent, you and I, the finite agent is free to stand in the place of God without the risk of any Luciferian claim to be the object of another's total devotion. In classical theological terms, the finite person is deified not by the accrual of unimaginable power, but by the worshipful embrace of a wholehearted responsiveness. Central to these three points are two orienting convictions, which I've tried to explore in some other context. One is the significance of the holy and necessarily non-rivalrous, non-competitive relationship between finite and infinite life. The second is the understanding of all intelligent perception as involving the awareness of perspectives other than that of the individual ego. The object that is seen or known is seen and known as always already seen and known. Now, Paul intends to declare to the Athenians what they act upon but do not know. And so this lecture is seeking to direct our thoughts to what we act upon but do not acknowledge in some of our central linguistic and ethical practices. So to my first topic of human dignity. There is a vigorous debate in theological circles, particularly in the English-speaking world, as to whether the notion of human rights, as generally understood these days, is fully compatible with a Christian anthropology. A number of influential voices, John Milbank, Oliver O'Donovan, Nigel Bigger, have been raised to argue that any belief that human beings are endowed with a set of intrinsic claims is hard to reconcile, both with the conviction of the absolute priority of gift in the work of creation and with the imperative of self-surrender, which is articulated in the gospel. Surely, it is said by scholars like this, surely the human person in biblical perspective is so thoroughly dependent and interdependent that the discourse of rights as inalienable endowment is at best a distraction from the central moral and spiritual labor of human responsibility. It's a persuasive argument and an important corrective to the increasingly fragmented and forensic approach to rights that has become common in recent decades. But it perhaps misses the seriousness of the founding impulse of those who first shaped the discourse of human rights. And this impulse might be summed up as the conviction that there is an appropriate set of responses to anything recognized as a human agent. Responses whose appropriateness does not depend in any way on the decision of a human individual or a human group. Recognizing a right is not so much, as is sometimes said, recognizing a simply identifiable duty on my part. It is recognizing that the moral standing of another person is not in my possession to give or withhold. It pre-exists the relation or encounter between us. It holds for people I shall never actually encounter or relate to in past, present and future. It is in some to do with accepting that what I meet here in the human other is not at my disposal or under my control. To come at the same point from a slightly different direction, this is a recognition that the moral standing of the human other is not something that has to be or can be earned. 
the appropriate response is not a reward for performance. Let me take an example that can be, but is the subject of much confused thinking. If a person is deprived of normal civic liberties as a punishment for criminal activity, this is not a suspension of the category of appropriate response to their humanity. The way in which we manage the deprivation of certain liberties has to have in view the moral standing of the criminal as someone held responsible for their acts, but also held responsible for the possibility of changed behavior as the outcome of the penal process. And the responsibility of the penal process is to acknowledge true culpability where it exists and to support behavioral change. If the workings of punishment have the effect of humiliating, disempowering, or stigmatizing, then punishment has failed, and the failure is a failure to see what is appropriate to the offender as a human subject. Or let me take another uncomfortably current issue. There has been much discussion recently of the pressure exerted on some pregnant women to abort a fetus which may exhibit signs of Down's syndrome or is in a category where the risk of this is high. There has been something of a campaign to eliminate the condition. National policy in Iceland has led to a near total eradication of Down syndrome by means of selective abortion. The implication has not been lost on those actually living with Down syndrome and their families. The implication that there is a prescribed norm of human capacity, which those with Down syndrome fail to exhibit. And so they fail to earn what would otherwise be the appropriate moral standard. It's a conclusion that ought to be familiar from arguments about supposedly inferior races in the 18th and 19th centuries, or even from what passed as scientific discussion in the 19th and early 20th centuries of the capacities of women. Not a happy ancestry for any moral view. At root, a defensible discourse of human rights is one that refuses any suggestion that we need to assess human capacity before acknowledging moral standards. The organic, physical recognizability of human identity determines what counts for us as an appropriate response. A set of facts which we, as human others, do not determine. To respond with appropriate attention. To respond, that is, in a way that grants the other a standing like my own, a proper expectation that their need and well being will be seen as morally significant in the same way as my own, is to accept that there is a response that is just, that does justice, as we like to say, to what is in front of us. And I would incidentally argue that the notion of doing justice to both the human world and its creator is one which we need to think through more carefully afresh. Now, justice cannot be done if I am in any sense claiming ownership of what confronts me. That is why slavery is so regularly presented as a kind of paradigm of the infringement of human rights and dignities. But as we become more alert in identifying modern versions of slavery, such as trafficking, indentured labor, child labor, child marriage, and child soldiering, we may be able better to grasp what is morally at stake here. The fundamental shape of unjust relations 
is the situation where one party reduces the other to a function that they can define and limit. Most damagingly, a function that is simply a matter of serving the interest of the first party. Security is won and kept by successfully discharging this function, earning dignity or respect. And the real moral energy of human rights language is in its attempt to secure the expectation of respect and nurture independently of successful performance. So far so good, we may say. So the mention of Down syndrome and the abortion question reminds us that there is a longish trail of inconsistency in the modern outworking and direction of this moral energy and a frequent slippage towards just that correlation of status with capacity that the schema of human rights is supposed to rule out. But how then do we establish a coherent basis for the presumption of inalienable moral standards? Affirming such a presumption is already a recognition that there is a problem in the human world with ineradicable conflicts of interest. If we live in a world where securing one group's or individual's interest at the expense of another is a routine matter. Rights, you might say, are asserted as a protection against an unmediated battle between acquisitive interests. If we are to follow René Girard's analysis of the origins of culture, the neural and cerebral developments that enable us to represent to ourselves the thinking of another human agent are also what make possible the peculiar spirals of rivalry that characterize human culture. Not merely the competition for resources that you find in the animal world generally, but the development of desire for what the other desires. We are socialized by imitation. Again, something that we have in common with other animals. But this socializing entails from the beginning, the imagining of another's narrative of wanting and achieving. And this act of imagining the other's narrative prompts the fear that what the other wants will be a limit on my own wanting and achieving. So that if I then want and achieve what the other wants, I forestall the possibility of frustration and secure my own projects. In other words, to be sure of the security or welfare I desire, I must learn to want for myself what the other wants. The treatment of this process by Girard and those who have learned from him, I think of de Michel and Wolfgang Pallada, continues to provoke controversy and skepticism, and frequently, I would say, provokes some fundamental misunderstanding. But it offers an unusually comprehensive account of how and why human beings need protection from the impulse to try and possess one another, to abolish the distance between agents and absorb the projects of others into those of the ego. René Girard takes this still further in his complex discussion of the way in which the ego's desire for the other's desire eventually constitutes the other, both as an object of unconditional and definitive longing, that's what I want to be, and as a supreme obstacle to the ego's attaining its goals. While the other is there, I cannot be myself. It constitutes the other as divine and diabolical at the same time. The other becomes an object of worship in the sense of commanding absolute attention and devotion, defining my desire, our desire. It is emulated and it is resented. And it is, says Girard, 
this doubling of reaction that enables the scapegoat mechanism to be activated. A dominant group identifies an individual or subgroup as simultaneously possessed of significant and threatening power, but also as alien and vulnerable. And it proceeds to their violent extermination or expulsion. They no longer block my desire, our desire. They can no longer own the good I have learned to want. Their removal from the scene allows the dominant and excluding group to celebrate its self-identity, its reconciliation with the longed-for sacred terminus of desire. Reconciliation with the divine. Girard, like Freud, wants us to think in terms of a literal, historical, sounding murder at the roots of every human culture. Whether the overall theory really requires this is not clear. I suspect it's not necessary. But what is clear is the mechanism by which the sacred is generated through the mimetic spiral, the spiral of imitation which eventually demands an act of collective and violent expulsion or exclusion. That which is both adored and dreaded is made the subject of successful negotiation by the sacrificial process. Now the relevance of this to our thinking about rites and about worship needs a bit of spelling out. But the connection is, I think, something like this. Human beings perceive themselves as living precariously. Their desires bounded by the insistent rivalry of others. They seek to circumvent that boundedness by making the desires of others their own. And so there is at the root of human life, life together, a profound fault the threat of an endlessly intensified competition which could issue in a war of all against all. Cohesion for society is secured by identifying a candidate for expulsion, the collective bearer of the mimetic fantasies of the group. Archaic religion is the regularizing of this mechanism since it is never done with once and for all. Thus far, Girard. And linking this with our Areopagitic starting point, we can then say two things. What is worshipped, what makes an irresistible claim on the ego, is in Girardian perspective, the ego's own alienated desire mediated by the imagined desire of the other. Our collective life as humans is haunted by a compulsive pressure towards absorbing and at best immobilizing or silencing one another. And in times of serious social crisis, this pressure leads to the scapegoating and expulsion, often the murder, of those who cannot defend themselves against the projection of frustrated desire. We don't have to look far in the contemporary scene or the rhetoric that combines a picture of the threatening other as both failing or weak and endowed with sinister and elusive powers. Thus, the idea of ascribing to human subjects a moral standing that is outside this mechanism becomes an important aspect challenging both the mimetic spiral, the spiral limitation, and the scapegoat ritual. We must learn to see the other as more than the model, rival, and obstacle to my desires. To put it in condensed form, we must see the other as more than simply other to me. But what is it that establishes the other as in this sense, turned away 
from its relation to my desire, to my ego. To see the other as living, desiring and acting out of a depth of difference that is inaccessible to me. The genius of Girard is to bring to light the way in which both the classical theological account of the divine nature and the specific narrative of the incarnate life of God the Word provide a decisive and liberating ground for this. The traditional doctrine of God, including the affirmation that God is immutable and impassable, is completely misconceived if we read it as a bloodlessly philosophical attempt to deny to the divine life some of the active and positive qualities we prize as finite subjects. By insisting that God is beyond need or lack of any kind, and that God is never passive to finite agency, this doctrine declares that God is in a fundamentally non-competitive relation with the universe. God is not one of several candidates for successfully filling a space within the universe. God's agency is not, like ours, evolving in a mixture of initiative and reaction. The way in which God sees the world can therefore in no sense be shaped by any kind of self-defense any kind of interest or self-interest. The divine regard for finite reality is the ground of its very existence. And so it can't be dependent or reactive. It can't be conditioned by what happens within the universe. In those terms, it is a very abstract formulation, but it can be translated immediately into a rather more direct recognition that the divine regard is never something to be earned. If God's action is creative action, bringing into being what is other to God and yet is open to God's life in act, that divine action is always a bestowal of reality and thus a loving self-communication devoid of self-interest. What, therefore, we see and encounter in any other human being, and indeed in the whole of the finite world as such, is that which is regarded by God with unconditional, unacquisitive affirmation. What is other to me is always already in relation to God, as a reality willed into being and loved by God. That is what is non-negotiable in the finite other. That is the ground of moral standing. But this recognition in the Jewish and Christian languages of faith of the non-rivalry between God and the world is not a deduction from general principle. It is anchored in specific narratives in which the relation between God and finite reality is given a decisive shape. Narratives in which God's distance from any kind of self-interest is rendered concrete in the form of both justice and mercy. God is encountered as doing justice to the world and doing so by manifesting mercy and love. Look, for example, at Genesis chapter 18, where Abraham is arguing with God about the fate of the people of Sodom. When Abraham intercedes with God for the people of Sodom, he casts his appeal in terms of God's consistency with God's own laws. Shall the judge of all the world not act according to statute? Says Abraham. The judge, Shofit, acting according to statute, Mishpat, deriving from the same Hebrew root. But that statute, that Mishpat, paradoxically, 
turns out to be the sparing of the wicked so as to guarantee the life of the righteous. This is an odd and disturbing justice which appears as inseparable from comprehensive mercy. In the prophetic tradition, God's unwillingness to give up the people that have been chosen because compassion was stirred in the divine heart. Look at the prophecy of Hosea, chapter 11, verse 8. This expresses the further paradox that God's consistency in mercy and love is the way God does justice to his own divine life and nature. God cannot cease to be merciful without ceasing to be God. So God's self-interest is the interest of those who have been created, chosen and loved. A justice that decrees punishment makes sense only within the context of divine self-consistency in seeking the good of what has been made. These attempts in the text of Hebrew scripture to clarify how the apprehension of divine mercy opens up a perspective and a justice that goes beyond simple reward undergird the developed and revolutionary narrative on which a distinctively Christian theology rests. In the life of Jesus of Nazareth, the divine life lives fully within a hum human finite agent without in any way reducing or compromising the integrity of the finite. And returning more directly to Jihar's framework, this divine agent taking flesh among us becomes the one whose murderous rejection uncovers the lethal nature of the scapegoat mechanism. God becomes unequivocally the victim of human power and violence. No shred remains of a divine power that will fight for its place by subduing hostile human activity. If my kingly authority derived from this world, then my servants would fight, says Jesus to the Roman governor. So what human society, trapped in the patterns of retributive fantasy and rivalrous power, expels and seeks to destroy in Jesus, is precisely the holy, guiltless, holy, non-violent affirmation of the other that is God's own life. And just because it is God's own life, it cannot be ultimately expelled or destroyed. It cannot be denied a place in the world because it does not seek a place in the world that is won and held at the expense of any reality within the world. The paradox of resurrection. The event of Jesus' crucifixion exposes the contradictory and arbitrary nature of scapegoating, its ultimate toxicity for the human world, its refusal of its own foundational reality. And it uncovers the character of the creative act that is beyond all rivalry and so is universally affirming and compassionate. From the point of view of this narrative of faith, the foundation of an unequivocal, universal valuation of every human organism is this revealing and imagining of a creative act involving eternal commitment to the freedom and well-being of the finite order. The doctrinal formulations of incarnation and atonement express in complex and extended terms the conviction of unconditional divine regard as the ground of all finite identity. And this, in turn, entails a comprehensive refusal of any object of worship other than the life revealed in these narratives. There is always a dimension or level of the life of any human subject inaccessible to ownership or control by any other finite subject. No finite agent 
has the authority to require another to abandon all right to self-definition, the possibility of shaping the conditions of their life. No finite subject is the embodiment of the ultimate and total good for any other finite subject. No finite subject can be simply the model for another's desire, adored and feared as the numinous ideal possessor of goods that are desired. So the ego and its other, its mimetic competitor, are alike free from their mutually destructive compact and the authority to resist the totalizing claim of any human system is established. The only intelligible terminus of worship, the only reality that can legitimately be expected to displace and recondition the human self, is that which is not in competition with power or control. And surrender to what in this way transcends the economy of rivalry, surrender to God, is not victory for one party and defeat for the other, victory for God and defeat for me. Because what is surrendered to is the generated love from which the self's very reality arises. Surrender to this is acceptance of what is already the self's actual and radical identity. Or in the more familiar formulation, from the highest possible authority, the one who loses their life will save it. Now, so far, I've been outlining how the classical grammar of Christian doctrine and Jewish Christian narrative bears on the question of how we can ground the notion of ineradicable right of universal human dignity. If convictions about this are not to be simply the corporate decision of a human majority, if they are to be genuinely something apart from power and choice in the human world, they stand in need of grounding. The Christian and Christocentric anthropology proposes such a grounding, declaring openly what has been hidden, declaring above all the secret toxicity of poisonousness of worship in the world of rivalry and destructive competition. But we noted earlier the role played in Jihadian thinking by questions about the origins of culture and language. And in the next rather shorter part of this reflection, I'm going to return to this issue of language and its associated topics of intelligence and self-understanding. To speak at all is to invite recognition. When I say something, I assume that I occupy a world that is not exclusively mine, a world where the criteria for speaking intelligibly are shared with others whom I may, may never have met, others with whom I have never negotiated any sort of agreed protocol for conversation. I don't simply assume, whatever it may sometimes sound like, that what I say is bound to make sense. I assume that the human stranger, even when speaking what seems a completely alien tongue, can make sense to me. The impulse to translate is universal. But in contrast to what some philosophical models the kind of models decisively challenged both by phenomenologists like Merleau Ponty and by Wittgenstein in his philosophical investigations. Con in contrast to what some models seem to imply, we don't gradually assemble evidence for the conclusion that the human stranger has an interior life comparable to my own, and then deduce that they're making sense on the same basis as me. No, I pick up a set of behavioral conventions patterns of making noise from my human environment. But I sort out in the process the kind of mental map in which I, as an agent or speaker, am located over against another agent or speaker. As Mervo Ponti puts it in his lectures on the origins of consciousness, we are no longer in the presence of two entities, 
expression of meaning, the second of which might be hidden from the first. Acquisition, the acquisition of language, no longer resembles the decoding of a text for which one possesses the code and key. Rather, it is a decipherer, where the decipherer does not know the key to the code. A child, Robert Ponty goes on, a child learns to speak because the surrounding language calls up that thought. The notion of being a conscious agent is one that comes into focus as I assimilate the patterns of sound to which I am intensively exposed, patterns that manifestly expect my imitative response. What's more, this is a process that goes in step with acquiring the concept of being a body, that is, imagining the bounded physical space from which I speak, including those dimensions to which I can't have direct sensory access. I can't see the back of my head. I can't walk around my body. St. Edith Stein, whose 1914 thesis on empathy significantly anticipates a great deal of what was later elaborated by Nola Ponti, argues in this brief work that the registering of the fact that I am physically alive is inseparable from developing the concept of life in the world around so that I know myself as always already potentially an object to the other. And in this process, I form the concept of plural centers of perspective. It's this recognition of plural centers of perspective that allows me to construct the very notion of a physical object and thus of a consistent spatial world. I acknowledge that the idea of a world is a continuous process in which I am one partner among many. And I acquire the notion of the body as intrinsically a center of pattern making, a zero point of orientation, and the collaborative mapping of a coherent environment. In this context, it's equally important to register that self-awareness is necessarily incomplete and that the sensorium of an individual body alone cannot deliver a coherent picture of the world or a coherent account of the body. Edith Stein notes that this also entails the fact that encounter with other embodied selves clarifies in various ways what we are not. It doesn't simply clarify the boundedness of our own embodiment, casts light on the partial character of our systems of value. Any ethic, in other words, requires corporate labor and the relinquishing of any aspiration to create a moral schema by the exercise of my will. The implication of this is that the search for a human ethical framework is always tied up with the articulating and exploring of a shared world. Each individual is preceded by the continuing life of ethical work, the negotiating of different schemes of value within a shared material environment where we have no option but to seek, hopefully, and need confidence for mutual intelligibility. Law and social protocol may accept and manage diversities often deep diversities in society, but argument manifestly continues, seeking at the very least some possibility of imaginatively penetrating and identifying with other convictions and drawing closer to a picture of the human good that can be owned increasingly widely. This is what I've elsewhere called an interactive pluralism in society, a situation where the constituent sub-communities of a society are free to argue over unchosen absolute imperatives. But the social and legal order overall does not seek to enforce any system of binding unconscious. But the point in relation to our wider argument is that the entire character of our work in constructing a concept or image of our humanity 
its embodiedness, its social nature, its capacity for memory and narrative, its commitment to making sense of, to, and with one another, works on the assumption that something is accessible to us as we speak together. An order of coherent communication which puts a certain sort of pressure upon speakers in the direction of convergence. We assume a shared world, not only in the obvious sense of assuming compatible levels of sensory experience in other agents or speakers, but at a more elusive level. Edith Stein makes a few very tantalizing remarks about how our imagining of other perspectives in the construction of the idea of the embodied self is parallel in some ways to the imagining of past selves, including the imagination of my own past self, what I call memory. We experience and understand ourselves as single embodied agents here and now, not only because of the network of current contemporary others whose perceiving I must imagine, but also because of the recognition of how this network extends back through time. The self is always embedded, more specifically, always engaged by what it has not itself generated, stimulated into coherent and collaborative mental activity by what is, to use the word again, accessible to us in the exchange of language. Linking this to our earlier discussion of the Girardian scheme, we can see how the mimetic spiral of Girard's anthropology is precisely a depiction of the shadow side of Edith Stein's analysis. To desire the desire of the other is indeed to assume a convergence of human experience, a mutual intelligibility in the form of a recognition of what the other wants or values as something I might intelligibly want for myself. As the British critic and philosopher Terry Eagleton observes, referencing Freud, where he might equally well have cited Girard, it is possible, Freud considers, that the project of culture or civilization demands more from us than we can properly yield. That is, the ideal of mutual transparency and coherent intelligibility among human beings has the capacity to become an idolatrous object of worship, demanding sacrifices it cannot rightly take. Yet that ideal is built into linguistic and social practice, a necessary aspect of any account of human identity that is not destructively and nonsensically individualistic. We shouldn't see Girard as offering a negative picture of the process of the formation in self and society and David Stein and other phenomenologists as giving a more positive image of cooperative world construction. The interdependence of cells in the labor of world or self construction is a mark both of the possibilities of convergence and mutual nurture in the human community and of the possibilities of murderous competition, precisely because I am able in some degree to understand and imaginatively own my neighbor's desire. And because I come to the recognition of my own desire through the mimetic process. If the Girardian analysis of destructive desire opens up the meaning of the revelation of a God who is entirely beyond the competitive struggle of finite agents sharing a world, Edith Stein's understanding of the empathic basis of our awareness of our embodied selves similarly offers a way into understanding what is meant by seeing the world as the product and the bearer of logos, the active communication of convergent meaning in the unceasing action of God towards creation. The act of trust involved in our speaking, the constant work of making collective sense, fits with the narrative of creation as an unconstrained act of intelligent love, communicating its own generous relationality in and through the ordered relation to finite things.
The two analyses of culture and knowledge outlined here, jihadian and phenomenological, suggest a reading of the human consciousness, as always both addressed or invited and insecure or acquisitive. This doesn't add up to some contemporary version of the five ways of Thomas Aquinas, or whatever other structure of argument towards the divine that may be thought of as canonical. Prophet pictures human consciousness in a way that converges strikingly with the implications of the Christian story of creation and incarnation. It's possible to say that if the reality of the divine were as Christian doctrine claims, this would make sense of these features of human awareness and agency. And also that if these are the salient and distinctive features of human awareness and agency, it is this kind of narrative of divine action that would most comprehensively address the imprisonment and aporia of human imagining and relating. It is what my colleague and friend Alistair McGrath has called with reference to C.S. Lewis, there are many aspects of John Henry Newman's thought would exemplify it also. It is an abductive mode of apologetic reason, not a deduction of conclusions from established premises, but a kind of heuristic appeal to a framework which connects and grounds various imperfectly articulated assumptions about human intelligence in action. <clears throat> And this takes us to our final area of reflection. If it is the case that the Christian narrative offers a solid framework for understanding the nature of human understanding itself, its justification is never going to be some conclusion that makes no difference to the self-understanding of the subject. Ludwig Wittgenstein notoriously said, that he could not believe in the resurrection of Christ without becoming a different kind of person. And he didn't mean that dismissively or negatively. The Areopagitic line of thought we've explored here implies that if we test the ultimate foundations of our working assumptions about our human world, we can come to see ourselves as the object of a transcendent and changeless regard and at the same time as wholly implicated in the interdependence of finite identities. The action of the transcendent source of affirmation upon us and our world is such as to make clear that our interdependence does not have to be violent, toxic and destructive if we step back from perpetuating the mimetic spiral, the violence of competition. To identify with the act that breaks the mimetic spiral, in Christian doctrine, to identify with the Creator's self-identification with the guilty and suffering creature, is the way in which the hidden truth of our humanity is allowed to come to light. Its destructiveness, its intrinsic relational connectedness. And it is a significant fact that such an identification can at times be seen in those who do not overtly profess belief in the Christian narrative, but believe that it is possible to embody the refusal of a mimetic and violent destiny. Interest continues to grow in the figure of Etty Hillison, whose notes and journals from the era of the Second World War and the German occupation of the Netherlands chronicle her journey from a sympathetic agnosticism to something like religious faith, though there is no sensible way of assigning her to any one religious community. She never abandoned her Jewish roots, though her vocabulary and reading became increasingly shaped by Christian sources. But what is most salient for our discussion here is the theme that recurs with increasing intensity in her writing about and from Westerbork the holding camp for those who would be transferred to Auschwitz, where she herself would be killed in November 1943. 
It is, by the way, an extraordinary coincidence that she met Edith Stein and her sister in Vesterbrook in 1942. Etty Hillison expresses this as safeguarding God or as clearing the path to God for others in oneself, being a mediator of the encounter with God, a means by which direct encounter with God can be opened up. Most strikingly, she declares that there must be, I quote, someone to live through it all and bear witness to the fact that God lived even in these times. She asks why she should not be that witness, saving God, conserving God in herself, taking responsibility, as she puts it, for shepherding the great and beautiful feeling of life that she carries. It is a very distinctive theme. She doesn't attempt to systematize it theologically in any way, but it is clearly grounded in her overwhelming sense that something had opened up within her that was quite beyond her comprehension, and that this gave her the resource to approach the appalling squalor and suffering of the transit camp and the casual cruelty of those administered with a clear perception of comparable death in every other she encountered, including the camp guards. Though she can record poignantly and honestly, that after one night of watching the guards rounding up people for transport to the death camps, she struggled with relating the faces of the guards to the biblical declaration of our creation after God's likeness. That message, he wrote, spent a difficult morning with me. But the central point is that her awareness of a persistent and never fully accessible depth in her selfhood, the belief in God, is strictly inseparable from the imperative to become a means of opening up that depth for others. If the existence of God is debatable, incredible, unintelligible for those around, her responsibility is to live in such a way that it would make sense to say that God lived even in these times. Connecting this to our early discussion, we could say that if language about God is language about, among other things, the actuality of non-competitive, non-revengeful, non-violent engagement with others, including violent and threatening others, that actuality becomes believable when it is actual in finite acts and lives. It is actualized in those lives through surrender, that is, in worship of what alone is worthy of worship, which is the generative reality of the non-worldly act of God, the act that does not contend with or displace finite action, but lives in the depth of finite reality and is able to work through that reality as and when it is radically opened up to be more completely a vehicle for the eternal act of gift. Etty Hillison's language about shepherding and safeguarding the divine, so far from making the divine dependent on created agents, is about witnessing to the persistence of an agency that is not vulnerable to defeat or extinction. The believer's act of faith is a stepping aside from the self-sufficiency that blocks the access of others to God, a self-forgetting. It is also an alignment with what gives the self its life in the first place. The believer can thus be said to stand in for God, to take on the responsibility of representing God by the radicality of their standing aside. Eddie Hillison sees her calling in the Vesterbrook transit camp as a letting go of whatever in her might stand in the way of God being credible and palpable to her neighbor. And this is the essence of the worship she offers. There is no gap between the act of self-surrender to God and the denial of private and protective self-interest in order to clear the way of the neighbor to God and God to the neighbor. 
It's not difficult to see how the life of faith understood in these poems embodies the insights from Girard, Stein, and others summarized earlier. The life of faith sets out to realize in the created order a non-defensive, non-interest-dominated life that is God's. The life whose manifestation in our history releases us from the lethal mythology of mimetic struggle and sacrificial exclusion. It implies a reimagining of human rights in terms of the perception of the other as one who needs me as an acquisitive or self-defended individual to step out of the light and allow God to be visible to them. A particularly focused form of attentiveness and service. It also assumes that my own growth into humanity needs always to be nurtured by the divine act and image in the neighbor, and that my receptivity to this is the key to my own release. That all of this is realized not by unaided imagination and human effort, but by the gift that is bestowed in the events of biblical history, culminating in the paschal mystery of rejection, and the overcoming of rejection by God, is not to be established by argument. But its evidences are to be found in the persistence of lives characterized by the mutual standing aside for the sake of God that will be found in the community of Christ's body. It is the argument, we might say, that is the lives of the saints. And the ongoing life of that body of Christ is centered upon the act of surrender and adoration that is the sacramental enactment of Christ's own life-giving surrender to the Father, the worship of the Eucharist. In our own recognition that we come to stand in for God in faith, a somewhat terrifying realization, we accept that this happens only in an unqualified embrace of our complete dependence on divine gift as the source of our being. And so the divinity we come to embody in the life of faith is always the divinity of the Word, the Son, eternally dependent on gift, eternally pointing to its source, standing in and standing aside. St. Paul's Athenian audience appear to have lost interest when he began to speak about Jesus and the resurrection. And the contemporary Areopagus is not likely to be any more receptive. But what these reflections have tried to do is to suggest the need for human society to understand something about true and false worship. To know that God alone is to be worshipped, because God alone has no desired goal to pursue, no interest to defend, and no coercive power to reinforce, is to know that no other claimant to worship is to be taken seriously, whether the external tyrant or the internal systems of desire. If God is to be worshipped, nothing else is. God's transcendence of the economy of negotiating and warring egos is the ground of that human transcendence of the claims of power that is seen in the confessors and martyrs, including those who, like Etty Hillison, might not have made anything remotely like an orthodox confession, but yet understood the imperative of resisting both idolatrous power and revengeful violence. And so the liberty of human beings from the economies of coercion and competition, as also from the anxieties of earning worth and security, is linked inseparably to the acknowledgement of a self-imparting divine action embodied in the drastic non-violence of Jesus, the bearer of the plenitude of divine meaning who is excluded by the exercise of human coercive power, yet manifests in his resurrection that coercive power can have no hold on the divine. The question of faith in the context of the modern Areopagus 
is still to do with that opening question, what do humans worship? And how does worship become life-giving rather than the ultimate tyranny? If God is not as manifested in the scriptural narrative, God's claim to worship is indeed no more than another case of the destructive pattern by which some are disenfranchised, silenced or annihilated by others within the world. Any apologetic inspired by Paul in Athens needs to attend to two interrelated tasks. It must return again and again to the clarifying of the underlying grammar of what the Jewish and Christian tradition says about God, and it must find ways of displaying how that tradition charts the way of liberation from the world in which the non-negotiable worth of human subjects is repeatedly eroded. This entails some close tracking of how we speak about ethics and language. But perhaps it is ultimately most engaging when it takes us back to story and practice, to the not always articulate witness of the person who offers their body as a place where God may become credible. And of course, to the collective practice of Christ's body in its performance of the transforming anti-sacrificial sacrifice of the Holy Eucharist. After all, one of those who did linger to listen further at the Areopagus was the Dionysius, to whom the entirely unreliable tradition ascribes those great classical works both on liturgy and on the self-forgetting inarticulacy of contemplation. Thank you so much, friends, for your patience with this presentation. I look forward very much to comments and questions. Oh, for, that's that's me who who, who who must to thank in the name of the Institute Angelicum and myself. It was a very deep insight in, uh, say, assumption of a possible or actual in dialogue with, uh, well, can we say pagan culture, uh, pagan philosophers, uh, modern Areopagus. Thank you very much. You uh, accept our invitation uh, for a Voitilan lecture somehow, and uh, you show us in how many points your thought and your way of thinking is parallel to some uh, Voitil idea. Uh, the central for him, the idea of human dignity uh, around, uh, around which he say, create his uh, f f philosophical thought, the communication, uh, the relation with the other, and definitely the, say, intuition of sacred. It's something uh, in the very center of his thought. So um, it's very interesting for me to see that uh, two thinkers uh, close through St. Paul and Evangelium, uh, are coming to very, say, uh, similar uh, conclusions. Uh, let me ask a few questions. I we received some questions from our view viewers, uh, the internet viewers, and um, and we have also ours. Um, so let me let me uh, start with a question. Um, on that what you rather today didn't focus. The speech of St. Paul uh, on Areopagus, apart from the quest of uh, common places to the Christian and non-Christian culture, has also two different uh, elements. It contains first critical perspective on the elements of pagan culture and uh, Secondly, Paul shows aspects of Christianity that are um, incompatible with the philosophy and culture of Greek and Roman world. Where in the modern world would you place the other two parts of uh, St. Paul's speech on the Areopagus? So firstly, what in contemporary philosophy and culture is unacceptable to Christian. In the case of St. Paul, it was idololatry and polytheism, mostly. 
And secondly, what in Christian teaching is today the most difficult to accept by the contemporary uh, Aropagites uh, for Stoic and Epicureans who, uh, who were present in, uh, in Athenian Aropagus, uh, it was resurrection of Christ mostly and call to metanoia, of course, in that Christian sense. That's my two question, question on, the, on the beginning. Thank you. Um, that's a very searching pair of questions, but I'll try to answer briefly both of them. As to what is unacceptable? Of course, when we're talking about contemporary philosophy, we're talking about an enormous variety of disciplines. But I would say there are perhaps two things that the Christian ought to be challenged. The first, perhaps, is the general suspicion of metaphysical thinking. And by metaphysical thinking, I don't mean any single system. I mean the, the concern to be able to say something about existence itself. The concern to say something about the conditions under which finite reality works. And I think the Christian always has to be pushing for that wider perspective. But if that is the case, of course, if we are talking metaphysics, we are, here's my second, we are always talking about something which is beyond the exercise of human decision and choice which is beyond an individual's construction, which is constantly to be enlarged but not completed in relationship. And many of those aspects of our thinking about the human have slipped out of our view. We have, in Western philosophy, generally inherited focus, in the modern period particularly, on the will of the individual, and even when we are talking about language and communication, there is still the risk all the time of a collapsing back in the perspective of the individual and the individual will and the individual want and desire. So I think those are areas where we, we challenge. But as to what is unacceptable or difficult for the non-Christian world. Well, as I said, St. Paul's presentation came to a rather untimely end when he started talking about Jesus and the resurrection. Mm. And I think that what is hardest for the contemporary world is, first of all, the belief that there is something which has actually happened within the human world in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. That is of transforming significance for every imaginable human situation. I think that's, that's very hard for people to do. Mm -hmm. And the consequence of that is that this makes a claim upon us, the claim of worship indeed, the claim to be explored and entered into to be lived through even in uncertainty, even in unclarity. We are invited into, as I've often put it, a different landscape, not just a set of conclusions, but a place to live. And I think here so often of Augustine's wonderful phrase in the Confessions, that faith is entering a country that is not just to be looked at, but to be lived in. Hmm. And if we're going to live in this different landscape, well, as with any landscape, we don't immediately have a clear sense of every detail. We have to grow, we have to move, and we have to learn. And both those things, both the, the claim of the universal significance of Jesus and the claim of a lifetime of committed exploration and growth, 
I think are very hard indeed for people who see the human world as irreducibly plural and who see human life as something other than a steady pilgrimage of growth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the um, third question is that, let's say, during the speech on the Areopagus, um, uh, which was definitely the, the first um, archetypal encounter between Christianity and Greek philosophy um, uh, and secular thought to, to take, take, take place. That's why probably why philosophers laughed at uh, chapter 17 so, so much, because we have our, our topic in the canonical <laughs> um, books. Um, that, that's that's not surprising um, that it's so important um, because the speech comes from the canonical book of the New Testament. It was written down by the hand of St. Luke and finally its speaker is the apostle of the, nation, the nations. Uh, and that all encourages us to, um, uh, to treat it as, uh, let's say, a kind of uh, uh, maître sèvre something very important, very, let's say, normative uh, somehow. But in fact, its ending is quite um, ambiguous and gloomy. Mm, only two listeners decide to join St. Paul. Uh, uh, in today's world, that's a, that's a question. Is dialogue with secular, secular thought just as futile and ineffective as was that in Athens, Athens or rather fruitful and enriching? What's your, uh, what's your, uh, 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 what's your opinion as a professor of Cambridge, um, in effect? Well, um, as I said, when Paul starts talking about Jesus and the resurrection, he begins to lose his audience. Yet, it's, it's not insignificant that there are two people who, who respond. And in that sense, because God is interested in every single soul, that's not a waste. Mm -hmm. And I take that as some encouragement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That ambiguous phrase, we will hear you another day in this matter, which the philosophers say to Paul, does at least mean that he has, he has opened some small space in their minds, in their hearts. And so when I personally engage in discussion and debate with non-Christian colleagues, and I attempt to make some kind of theological sense of a philosophical idea. Part of my purpose is simply to keep the door open. That is to say to the intelligent unbeliever, you may not see this, but we do not inhabit completely different universes. We are still able to speak to each other. And we continue that until there's a moment of recognition. And of course, as often as not, the moment of recognition is not the moment where the argument has been concluded. The moment of recognition is much more personal. As I suggested in the last part of what I said, it may be the, the life of someone in whom the divine life has come alive. That is the converting reality that allows someone to believe that they can, in Wittgenstein's terms, become a different kind of person. I think here of the impact of the life of St. Teresa of Calcutta on the English journalist and intellectual Markham Muggeridge, who became a Christian and eventually a Roman Catholic, because, not of an argument, but because of seeing something fleshed out. But equally, I think he would not have taken the step he finally did becoming a Christian, had there not been a steady engagement over years with the arguments, so that he, his, his world was not completely sealed off. So when we engage, I don't think we should have great hopes of armies of professional philosophers and 
scientists queuing up for the baptismal font immediately. But we seek, as I say, to keep a foot in the door, to keep the door open, to say we will go on working at realizing the common world we share, so that when the moment comes where the offer of grace is more visible in the life of the situation, you may perhaps know what, what you're responding to. Yes, indeed. As, as Boomer says, uh, none of God's name is success. Uh, so, uh, so, so it's not the best measure. Uh, l let me... I think if I may just add a, a quick extra to that. Mm -hmm. That's something of the, the spirit with, it, with which we approach a number of comparable areas. I think when we're engaged in interfaith, exchange. Once again, I don't think we're talking for victory. We are trying to make some sense of where we are, to establish the beginnings of a common recognition, so that if ever the utterly clear voice of Christ-shaped holiness speaks, there will be a possible coming together. Mm -hmm. Let me give you two questions from our audience, um, John Allen asks you, for non-Christians who don't accept your analysis of worship, what's the basis of non-competitive and non-revengeful framework of human rights? Thank you. Um, again, a very searching question. Um, I would say briefly, if our concept of human rights does not have in it somewhere the notion that the reality, the solidity of the other is quite independent of my desire, convenience, or whatever, it doesn't have that element within it, then it remains vulnerable to someone's decision to absorb it, to swallow it up. I think of all those who stood out against various kinds of tyranny and totalitarianism over the last century and indeed longer. People who were willing to say, hmm, the, the dignity of the other that I seek to serve is something independent of both you and me. I think of, um, well, the, that remarkable man, Cardinal von Galen of Münster, and his um, resistance to the Nazi policy of exterminating the unfit, the mentally and physically unfit. Essentially, what von Galen is saying is, it is not up to me or to you what the fate is of these people. They are images of God. And that is a given. Now, of course, if you are dealing with people who don't accept the theological premise, you have to come at it negatively and say, what are the consequences of supposing that there is no dimension of human, the human being that is outside my potential control? Then, as I say, you are, I would say, left with that constant risk that human rights, human dignity, become subject to a majority vote. And whether or not you accept the doctrine of creation in the image of God, you may need at least to hold open the idea that there is something given in the human person which resists capture and absorption by my will and decision and preference and so on. So I'd want to come at it in that rather negative way. What would be the result of not affirming that further dimension, that inaccessible dimension? And it seems to me that in dialogue after dialogue, that is an area where secular argument tends to, hmm, to steer away from the difficulty. Well, uh, so if there is no God, what am I a captain? 
somehow that's that's a question. What 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 am I, ombudsman? <laughs> well, the, the the last question from Patrick Vanya, um, uh, very good for uh, the ending of our discussion. Uh, unquote. How do you? envision the possibility of a renaissance of Christianity in the condition of contemporary secular culture, unquote. Well, that is indeed a very large question to end with. Um, and if I had a clear answer, um, I'm sure I'd be a, both a happier and a more popular man. But um, let me say two or three things. The first is something I feel I always have to say in these circumstances, that if the church is God's creation, and if the Christian faith is the truth about God's life and God's dealings, then oh, the church and the Christian faith will continue in our world. But I think it's important that we remind ourselves that the survival of Christian faith and Christian sanctity does not depend on our resources and our ingenuity. And I think we do sometimes need an injection of confidence, not a triumphalist confidence, but simply the confidence that God honors his promise to be with us at the end of days. Mm -hmm. So I just say that to put it out of the way but because, of course, in practice, we would like to see the renaissance of Christianity. I think that the two areas where I, I am most um, encouraged are, first of all, the fact of the persistence of concern with an interest in Christian themes in quite a lot of the world of the literary imagination. It's not, it's not as if our literary and artistic world has completely forgotten the Christian imaginarium. It doesn't understand it very often. It can use it for strange purposes. But it's not forgotten. And I'm interested that in both Britain and the United States, a number of people writing fiction and drama still return to this. I would like Christians to have the skill and the confidence to be there to explore and open up again the assumptions that are being made. But of course the other area is that in the last perhaps, three or four decades we've seen a most extraordinary revival of interest in the contemplative life and the disciplines of contemplation in Western Christianity. Sometimes this has expressed itself in strange or exotic forms, and sometimes it has been precious or life-denying or whatever, but I do see in many kinds of religious life at the moment, even though so many great classical centers of religious life and monastic practice are not what they were. I do see an energy and an authenticity that attracts people. I see people who are drawn by the, the example of the little brothers and little sisters. I see those who want to spend time with meditation together in a Christian context. I see the sense that people are addressed and challenged by lives that, well, in Itty Hillison's sense, show that God lived in these times. And I think as Christians, we should be talking more about those lives and those disciplines. We should, of course, be encouraging vocation for those lives more 
enthusiastically and finding the vehicles of common life that, that have credibility and durability in these different times, difficult times. Um, I speak as someone who came back yesterday from spending 24 hours with a friend who is a hermit in the mountains of West Wales and whose capacity as an example of teacher point of contact is something extending well beyond the area where they live. And yes, I, I have some hope and confidence that that simply because it speaks of transformation that, that has a power to it. And of course that does relate also to the renaissance we need in our liturgical life. And the restoration and the enrichment of the liturgy as something which is not a spectacle, but is part of that new landscape we enter, where unthinkable new possibilities open up, strange and fresh perspectives. It is why the liturgy ought never to be shrunk, reduced, or rationalized. But that's perhaps for another day. Yeah, to Bishop Williams, thank you very much for your answers and for a very deep and interesting lecture. Thank you very much. It was thank very you. thank you for your kind status as interlocutor. Inspirational. Um, I would like to thank also uh, Father Hyacinta de Stivel for your presence uh, uh, for, to all the organizers, but um, uh, first of all to our audience. Um, thank you very very much for many more questions I can ask. Um, I'm sorry, there is no time to uh, uh, to ask all of them. Mm. I would like to uh, invite you for a next lecture from the JP2 lecture series. It will be the European identity, North and South, the main light of divide by Professor Marek Cichotsky, which will take place on January 21st at 2.30 p.m. Now again, thank you very much and I hope to see soon, uh, maybe face to face, not only uh, in that, let's say, COVID style, uh, which by the way have some or many pluses. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you.